Good morning. It's with a great deal of pleasure that I'm going to introduce our distinguished lecturer this morning. Her name is Ernestine Bradley. She comes all the way from New Jersey. She is the wife of Bill Bradley, the former U.S. Senator and 2000 presidential candidate. Uh, Dr. Bradley has her degrees from Emory University, her undergraduate degree, her master's, and her PhD in comparative literature. She is a grandmother with four grandchildren. Indeed, she is a survivor of cancer uh, for over a decade, breast cancer. Uh, she's had a very interesting background as the wife of an aspirant to the United States presidency. And of course, she has had book that is very well reviewed uh, as someone who is warm and engaging with a very moving life story. It is indeed my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bradley to you. Please give her some, a round of applause. Uh, today, I'm primarily going to talk about the memoir that I wrote. It came out two years ago as a heartbound and recently as a paperback, and it is called The Way Home. And of course, The Way Home, I'm sure there are lots of people here who had to find out where home is and how the way leads and when do you get there, if you ever get there. So since it is a memoir and not an autobiography, um, the question of memory and what you remember and how you remember is, of course, in itself part of uh, what I was trying to reconstruct. And if I'm getting too much into literary aspects, you know, you will afterwards tell me it wasn't all that interesting. But basically, you know, how does the memory work? What do you remember? Can you test it against other people's? Uh, uh, remembrances and against the facts. Uh, that has been one of the questions, and particularly, you know, being German born, and I made part, a major part of my academic studies, you know, what has been remembered about German history and how has it been remembered from 1945 on. I always question how memory works and what we remember. So this is one level of the way home that I was trying to do. Another level uh, that I found very interesting and I was almost observing myself being uh, the participant in what I was observing and that has to do with how much we are really influenced by um, in my case, by family history, you know, by parents' anxieties or experiences, and how these experiences are then handed down in an almost unconscious way to their children. For example, that I learned languages had in large part to do with my mother, who was so scared at the, at, in 45, would the Americans first come or the Russians? And I was a little kid, but she said, learn languages. Maybe then we can talk ourselves out of, you know, she was thinking maybe another time something similar will happen. We can talk ourselves out of being hungry or of being raped. And maybe you could then get us some food if you spoke the language of whoever the occupiers were. I learned languages, but maybe not for her reasons. But nevertheless, you know, that interconnection in so many different ways, I also wanted to explore. You know, the way home has to do with who am I? And what were the formative influences, the specific influences, not just my mother, my father, whatnot, but specific details. So that I was also trying to find out. And then I, had, well, maybe not so much problems because, you know, writing a memoir is almost like going into an unconscious state and you write and write and you see what comes out and it's not sequential at all because memory works by association or dreams, you know, rather than and then and then and then. 
But so what I did want was to convey that also that this is a memory, the constant questioning, the constant genesis of what you read. How did that get onto the paper? And coming from German literature, which then became my, well, German, but also other literature, but German in particular, where I published most, had to do with the fact that you cannot compartmentalize. You know, when you write about your life, you can say, OK, this happened when I was 10, this happened when I was 11, but that's not how you write a memory, a memoir. So I constantly wanted this multi-level interaction of, you know, I see something and it creates associations and then I get off into the associations and then I come back to something else. But it is like a multi-layered narrative where you cannot, and I, you know, in case you want to ask me later on, um, one of the major objections I have to Günter Grass is that he compartmentalizes. One chapter on this, chapter done, let's get on to the next chapter. And they're all very interesting chapters, but they do not show how we are formed and how these influences continue, change, what we might otherwise have become, and then we see the result. So that was more or less the technical aspects that um, went into the memoir. As far as the topics are concerned, and Clancy already mentioned this um, to some extent, uh, one of them, of course, was being born during the Nazi regime growing up then and during the post-World War II period. Uh, that was very important to me. Uh, and I will expand on this a little bit uh, later on. The second aspect that then also became really life-shaping, life-forming, became an ongoing preoccupation in which I grew and interacted and, and was constantly you know, on the way, like the title of the book says, had to do with the fact that I was already in the United States and I was getting my PhD in Atlanta. Of all the places, this is where I was first really uh, made aware of the Holocaust. One of my, well, my dissertation advisor was a refugee from Nazi Germany. And I, for some reason, didn't really uh, feel I needed to study German. This is how limited I was, because I thought, well, I know German. Why should I study German? So I continued what was the love of my life, and that was French. And there was Walter Strauss, who was also born and the native of Germany, and was also teaching French. We both stayed away from Germany, but for and German, German literature, but for very, very different reasons. And I was progressing then in my studies, and he then one day said to me, Ernestine, do you know what country both of us come from? And so then through Walter at first, uh, uh, I really became, well, what, what is the right word? I really tried to come to some understanding, and it has taken me a life, and I'm certainly not done with it, uh, to some understanding that I really come from a country that has perpetrated these most horrendous crimes. And how do I deal with it, even though I can say, well, you know, I wasn't a part of the criminal activities. So this has been a lifelong um, undertaking, which I then have focused very much into my academic work and have used German literature like a, almost like a screen to um, work it out and come to some terms. This is sort of the second major um, cluster of uh, ideas, I would say, and feelings. Um, that I then also go into. And again, as you can imagine, this is not something where I say, OK, this chapter is dealing with the Holocaust. Now let's move on to something else. You cannot, because these are lifelong, continuous attempts to come to terms with a past and a present, and an attempt to then you know, project into the future. 
And then the third major and again life-shaping event, uh, although that was fairly recent, it was only, I should say, but it's a huge number, 14 years ago, and that's when I had cancer. And, you know, even if I look at a group uh, like this one here, I know that there are people here, sadly, who have gone through cancer. And, uh, and, and I hope that we all rejoice and that we all feel every day is really a gift. But it has given me an, an intensity and an awareness of life that maybe I didn't have before, that I took you know, life a little bit more for granted. Uh, and now I don't. What I thought I wanted to talk a little bit about because it shows the interaction and the complexity of, you know, facts, interpretations, projections, questioning, even the facts, not only the memories of the facts. Um, and I thought it would also give you a little bit of an insight into Germany. So I'm going to speak a little bit about my two fathers. Um, and that then uh, played a slight role during Bill's campaign in 2000. It may have become something bigger, although I doubt it. Uh, because, of course, if I have two fathers and I have only spoken about one, then the question was, well, is she hiding something? You know, particularly coming from a German background, that was a very important question. So let me go back to my parents. Uh, my father was born in 1912. My mother was born in 1916. So both of them sort of grew into, you know, what this country calls the Great Depression. My father was 18 in 1930. And uh, he came out of this old guild crafts system. And he was supposed to be the son who takes over the family business and whatnot. And he had decided with 18 that if he could make it to get away from home, he would. And if you may, you see, I'm going back further and further, and it's history, but it is what fascinates me so much, the interaction and the influence of you know, politics and social customs and what we would now call history on the lives and the shaping of the lives of individuals. So in, um, as you know, particularly this group knows, uh, one of the charges after the peace treaty of Versailles in 1919 was that Germany could no longer have a military, that there were only 100,000, and that was it. Okay, uh, but the individual states had what I think we would call, you know, state troopers, state police. And because the number was so low, they could be picked and they had to be in, you know, athletes and smart and all of these wonderful things. So my father was 18 years old and he was a great athlete. And uh, he went to Munich to the police headquarters and applied and whatever. In any event, he was taken, uh, accepted in 1930 when he was 18. And he thought he could have a career as a state trooper and climb up the ladder, whatever. My mother, born in 1916, came from a family of six. And when 1929 and 1930 hit, and in Germany at that time, higher education, you had to pay, you know, even high schools, you had to pay in order to get into the university track. So she had to stay, and this was another thing why maybe I then paid so much attention to higher education. I grew up with the fact that she would always say, if only I had had the chance, if only, you know, and of course, if only, I don't know how academically intelligent she really was. She was never tested. She was always allowed to maintain the dream of saying, you know, I could have done this, I could have done that. And I must say, um, in, you know, when she was maybe in her 60s, and I look at all of you assembled here, 
And I said to my mother, now you have time. Why don't you go back? Why don't you do it now? And it was my great disappointment that she said, well, I'm too tired now. And, you know, and it's understandable, but having grown up with this fervor in her voice, I was disappointed. And I really congratulate all of you for being here and for, you know, not saying you're too tired. So uh, my mother then knew she could only go through, well, what in German is called die Volksschule. And at the end of that, she was 14, she started to apprentice herself to a hairdresser. Uh, and if you know the apprentice system, you have to go through three years of apprenticeship before you then cl again climb up the ladder. And she started to go off to school and worked for free, just so that she would, this is 1930, just so that she would be assured of having a position when she was a year older. And, you know, my mother was very lively and very charming, and she had these curls, and, you know, and she was very attractive to men, which, of course, I, as a daughter, always despised, you know, <laughs> because she would perform even for my boyfriends, you know, how charming she could be. Well, that, that was not, you know, the way for a teenage uh, daughter. But in any event, she became a hairdresser because Number one, she thought, you know, from the movies of the Weimar period, if you ever saw any of those, hairdressers were always very elegant and very fancy, and they always had a little money, you know, from the tips. So she thought this was a possibility into a more glamorous life eventually. She and my father met because they were both uh, members of a sports club. My father, because he was a real athlete. My mother, I think, more for social reasons. But she went, and she, you know, she was a great, what, what, the, the Kugelstoßer, what do you call that? Exactly. And she had very strong arms, you know, and she used to intimidate my father that she could do that. Um, so in any event, they met there, and eventually, when my mother was 18, my father was 22, my mother got pregnant with me. And, and now comes again, you know, this interaction. My father, being a member of the state troopers, could not get married, that was the rule, until these young men were 27. So at that time, he was 22. And my mother, who was 18, then took it upon herself because she knew how much, you know, all the goals he had and the aspirations, and he took night classes and he traveled. And she knew that if she would tell him he would marry her and the life would, you know, be over, or at least this glamorous future that they that he thought he had. But think of it, this is now 1934. It's one year into Hitler. Well, the glamour wasn't going to be there anyway, but, of course, at that time, they didn't know that. So my mother then decided that she was not going to tell him, and because she was so charming and because she was so attractive, she uh, married the son of the beauty parlor where she worked. And, and in retrospect, you know, there again, memory, I really do not have, I have one memory of that man only. And that was when the war started, you know, mobilization in August of 39. And I was riding on the bicycle, he had me on his bicycle. There I still see him, but I do not see him anywhere else. And now comes the interpretation, you know. Did I really not see him that much because he was always working with my mother, they were always going out, you know, entertaining clients, they were always driving. My mother had a red car and red hair and it was a convertible, you know. And the last thing she really wanted was 19, 20 years was a child. You know, she wanted to live. So, I was wondering, you know, were they always gone? But I also know her husband 
Maybe he had no interest in this child. You know, he was nice enough to marry the woman because I assume he loved her. But he wasn't going to be a father to this child. They both wanted to live. That's what, you know, was their marriage about. So I cannot really remember. I can only retrospectively invent reasons why my memory doesn't tell me. You know, so, so this whole process, I also, in many, many d different other instances, but I said I wanted to use this as an example. You know, you have to question what was there, and you can't find an answer, so you write almost like a hypothetical history. So in any event, what in retrospect I also didn't know, and I only found out in 2000 when all the documents had to be investigated before Bill ran, right? Um, that I thought my mother was maybe two or three months pregnant, but no, she was six or seven months pregnant before she got married. And you know, when I think about it, the agony she must have gone through, because she knew she could not come home with a child out of wedlock. Then everybody would have asked, well, who is the father? And she would have had to marry my father anyway, ruining his life prospects, right? So in retrospect, I have often wondered, they, meaning her mother, her family, my biological father, they must have been able to count. It's not that hard to count nine months, you know? And, and when my mother then gave birth to me, they could have counted back. And again, there are the silences. Nobody ever talked about it. And one of my scholarly studies, you know, which has nothing to do with my family, but was an analysis of West German literature, I called that volume The Language of Silence. And of course, it's like almost a whole history exemplified in the most prominent writers of West German literature and how they dealt with the Holocaust. But it was still focusing on the silences, on the unstated and yet un, you know, undercurrents, and where you could sort of, in literature, more easily than in life, you can say, here is the, uh, the silence, here is the dead spot. Well, in life, it wasn't quite that easy. And I wasn't so much aware, so I could never ask my grandmother, didn't it ever bother you that your daughter got married and then the child was born two or three months later? Didn't you ever wonder who the father was? You know, so these questions I could not answer because I wasn't aware while she was alive. And then later on, it was too late. But the silences, the whole family must have been silent, the sisters, everybody. OK, so now I have to do a little bit of a fast forward. I don't want to take too much time. Uh, as you also know, you know, Germany then uh, started World War II, invaded Poland in uh, 1939, in summer, September 1. Uh, Hitler had the non-aggression pa uh, pact with Stalin. So that and Stalin, of course, armed, 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 built up and bought time, really, and so did Hitler. Uh, then Hitler, if you want to call it violated, broke the non-aggression pact in summer, uh, early summer, June, July of 1941, when the German army invaded the Soviet Union. Uh, my father had a brother. And my mother had a brother who were in the first troops, uh, not in the same divisions, but they both at the same time were in the advancing troops into the Soviet Union. And they both were killed in October of 41 in different parts of the front. And you know the horrible thing, now this is a little bit of an aside, but I have oftentimes thought, my goodness, you know, soon after the army, the Einsatztruppen came. And uh, of course, in, in Poland, they did this immediately in 39. But then they also came after the Soviet Union was invaded in 41. And I thought, my goodness, if I had to contemplate that either one of my uncles 
were cooperating with the SS or with the Einsatzgruppen, you know, which we now know they did, and which for a long time, again, German historiography had been silent about. There was this big cleavage between what the army had done, which was fight, and what the SS had done. So in a sense, you know, I'm, I don't know, grateful that I was spared to have to look at my two uncles from their point of view. But simply because I don't have to look at my two uncles doesn't mean we aren't all or we weren't all Germans. And I still, as a born German, I still have to face the historic facts, even though my family wasn't directly implicated. But, so now I come back to the story. They were both killed in October of 41, and at that time my father was in the Air Force, and he was given a few days furloughed to go home for a memorial service, and my mother came from a different town where she was to the memorial service of her brother. And my father, my biological father, went to see my mother's mother, to give her the condolences over the death of her son and, and so on. And apparently he casually asked, and is Erna, my, my mother's name is Erna, Ernestine Erna, uh, is she coming? And my grandmother said, yes, yes, yeah, she's coming with such and such a train and she'll be here. And now this is one of the scenes, you know, I don't know what the memory I can only remember my mother telling me, and it's my mother's memory. And it may be exalted, it may not even be true, but this is how she sees it. And I have been profoundly, profoundly moved every time she told me. And we would go to the spot in the street and she'd say, see, this is where he stood, and this is where he came. Because my father, when he knew what train my mother was arriving on, went to the train station to pick her up or to see her. Now they had not seen each other in seven years. No contact, nothing. And there, they, you know, and, and really I see this with a, almost like a film director's eye. She comes from the train station, he comes on the street, they come closer and closer and finally they see each other. And after they say hello, whatever, my father, apparently, this is now my mother's memory, my father says to her, I hear you have a little girl. And my mother says, what do you mean, I have a little girl? <laughs> right, and this apparently was the first my, my father realized that he was a father. You know, and when, when apparently when he said to my mother, I hear you have a little girl, I always wince. I said, how insincere can that be? You know, he could have counted also backwards those nine months to figure out who the father is, right? But he didn't. So there was this great meeting, and my father now realizes or is confronted with the fact that he has a six and a half years, I had just started first grade, uh, little girl. And I remember, so of course he wanted to see me immediately, and I lived with a sister of my mother's at the time, and I remember my mother coming, and behind her, this man, you know, in an Air Force uniform. And as is very common in Germany and in Austria, you know, the friends of your parents are introduced as uncle and aunt. So I saw this man, and I was told, Wuschelein, this is uncle so-and-so. Okay. So I, that scene, but it's a very, very clear scene in me. And I assume what I remember most is the intensity of the adult emotions. You know, my mother, my father, my aunt, and there I'm surrounded by, by these intense feelings. I think that's why I remember so indelibly. And then, so okay, and then one more fast forward and then that's it. And I've, um, I was then eight years old, 
when, and I remember that also very, very clearly. It was summer because, you know, you go, you're put to bed early. It was now 43. Uh, Germany was no longer victorious. You know, the retreats had begun. It was after Stalingrad. And my mother took me to bed. The sun was still out. That's why I know it must have been summer. And she then told me that Uncle Beps is really my father. And um, I remember how the sun went, you know, and she must have told me for a long time because the sun came in at a certain angle. And when she was finished telling me, the sun had left. And I find that I still do this today when some very emotional news are brought to me. I always deflect to the outside. I can remember the outside, and somehow I don't hear everything that is being said. And you know, now as an adult, I find it's a very interesting protective psychological mechanism. But whenever something like that happens, nowadays I say, okay, I have to come back to it. You have to tell me over. And there have been times when people, you know, like with the cancer, I'd have to ask three, four, five times before it would sink in. And I can only remember that was the first time where I remember the sun, I remember my bed, I remember my mother sitting at the bed, and I was told that. And what I also think came out of this, of this, well, what, event, encounter, sitting there, my mother telling me, something that I wasn't aware of when I was younger, but as I grew older and today, I hope I'm fully aware of it, that I began to doubt facts. Because my father, you know, the legal father, was not my father. But there was this other man whom I really had considered, or I considered from then on, an intruder. Because now my mother, of course, was very much in love with him still. So that reality is not what it is supposed to be. So it's not only words or thoughts or interpretations that may or may not be what they portray, but the facts themselves were not what they seemed to be. And of course, you know, that then goes very nicely now with postmodernism and, and, and whatnot. But as a formative experience, uh, it has really cast a, I don't want to say a shadow, but it has really given me a kind of an interpretive angle that has stayed with me for my whole life, and particularly in literature, into which I think I poured much more than just the technical or the, the knowledge you know, of books and whatnot. This capacity, or as my mother would sometimes say, the, almost this curse, this negative side that I would always doubt and always try to find another angle and always interpret and find there are many, many different ways of interpreting and they may be simultaneously true and they may exclude each other and yet both might be true. You know, all of this then were wonderful tools that were then systematized in literary theory. And of course, deconstruction is all about that in a sense, or at least the way I then interpreted deconstruction, if you want to go that far. But so this was a very, very formative uh, experience to me. And now I can talk you know, about many other things, but I went into detail in order to show you how even the most intimate personal decisions, like my mother saying she was not going to tell my father she's pregnant, or then when they saw each other again, you know, telling me how all of this then plays against a much larger background. You know, they may not have met again, or not for a long time, if both brothers hadn't been killed in the Soviet Union at the same time, so that they would come 
home and meet each other again. And this interplay, you know, where we often are not even aware of it when we think we make very personal uh, decisions, and yet we are truly influenced by things that are so much more powerful. So that's why I went into great detail. It then played out a little bit in the year 2000 when Bill ran. And of course, there was the question, you know, a German wife or a German-born wife, because I became an American citizen the first chance I had after five and a half, six years. So uh, of course, what we did was uh, there was the Berlin Document Center, and we had all the files back through my grandparents, checked whether they had been members of the Nazi party and whether there was anything that could come out, there was anybody a member of the SS. So I felt, you know, my grandfather was, in fact, a member of the Nazi party. And they sent me the documents. And he joined, and, but that's yet another story, you know, but he joined. Uh, very early, I think in, after Hitler came out of you know, this one year of incarceration, he founded the party again. And my grandfather joined. And then I was so relieved to see he joined in 25 and he resigned in 26. And again, I said, oh my goodness, I got off the hook. You know, by being able to, to see that, my, yeah, for whatever reasons, you know, my grandfather has a story that is probably as interesting or whatever you want to call the story of my parents, also politically. So, but, so I was very relieved that there was nothing, you know, that could be held against Bill as he ran with his German wife. But I had, after the war then, you know, I was, well, how should I, I have to be very careful now, uh, because I had thought I had been adopted by my biological father. You know, during the war, my mother then got divorced from her first husband, um, was then not allowed to marry my father because she was divorced and not good enough, got pregnant again, and therefore, because she was now bearing another child for this wonderful Hitler leader, she was then allowed to marry my father. But so in any event, they were married in 44. And then after the war, we moved to, my, to the hometown where both my parents came from. And again, my father then said, you know, Wushilen, why don't you go right away by my father's name, my biological father's name, which was now my mother's name, and my brother and my sister who were born afterwards. He said, you know, it's just a question of time, and the legal process takes a while, but you will be adopted, and, and Misselbeck will be your name. 10, 11 years old, what did I know? So I had always assumed that I had then been adopted. And only in, so then there was a, a town archivist in Germany who went into records that I had not had access to, that I had wanted, and who then went on the internet, you know, and from a German point of view, he had a different angle. There we are again, the different interpretations. But he went on the website and said, well, you know, there is Mrs. Bradley, and her husband is now running, you know, for the nomination, for the Democratic nomination. But, you know, she's really the daughter of a hairdresser. He really demeaned that poor man who had been so kind to my mother and who at least had a hair salon, you know. Um, she's really the daughter of a hairdresser and not of this man. And my father, after the war, found my biological father. He founded his own party, and he became mayor, and he was a very prominent businessman. So this town archivist was trying to say that I was upgrading myself, you know, that I'm now saying I am the daughter of this man rather than of the hairdresser. That was his angle. But in America, of course, it played very differently. What is she hiding that she doesn't mention, you know, her legal father who was in my birth document and not the father who I was referring to as my father? So it was very, very nice. The Washington Post did a long 
article, I think it was even two articles, and everybody was very, you know, um, caught in my mother's story and her self-sacrifice to my father's aspirations. So we don't know if Bill had stayed in the race, whether that would have become a major issue or not. But there again, you know, this fact had vastly different interpretations about, you know, which is my father and why didn't I say whatever. So um, only in 2000 did I then find out, and in fact, one of the reasons why I really felt I wanted to write those memoirs was because I was so angry at this town archivist, and I then uh, tried to sue him because, because he had violated the Data Protection Act. You know, not for the information itself, because he had the birth document where, you know, my mother's legal husband was listed as the father. Uh, but uh, so I didn't, you know, it didn't come to suing him, but there was a retraction of what he had said. And it wasn't a personal retraction, but it was the city, because he was an archivist and he was working in the interest of the city. The city took a censure from you know, the Data Protection Agency, which was about as far as one could go. But, and I think my anger, now again in retrospect, now we come to the interpretation of my anger. Why was I so angry? And really it was, number one, because I had never had access to those documents, which the town archivist clearly sat on. And number two, I had, I then went to Munich on several occasions. I wanted to know where my adoption papers were. I wanted, you know, to, and found out that biological parents cannot adopt their children. You know, which I had not known. So then what happened? So apparently, you know, my parents had lied to me. And that was probably another propellant to write uh, the memoirs, The Way Home. Um, all they could do by law was to change my name. Uh, meaning, you know, that if a wife comes from a first marriage and she marries a second time and the children then have the, the children born in the second marriage have a different name from the ones born in the first marriage, so that that child or those children should not feel ostracized but part of the family, you can, in, you know, you can change their family name. And I assume this is what happened. But there again, you know, you cannot get at the facts, you cannot, and even if you knew the facts, you really don't know what the facts are. So at this time, this is now 2001, my mother is, 2000, it's after the bill dropped out, my mother is failing rapidly. I said, Muti, what happened to my adoption papers? I need my adoption papers. And she was in bed and she had one of her, you know, she, since she was failing, but she really rallied to herself. And she said, your adoption papers? Ah! And she had this hand gesture, which is one of the themes in the book, you know. Ah! We tore them up. We knew you were our daughter. You know, my father, my biological father. And my, we knew you were our daughter. We didn't need those papers. Well, you know, that was another propellant where I said, I really need to find out, you know, and I don't want to say to find the truth because by now I knew there was no one single truth. But I do assume that she, that there were no papers. She didn't have to tear them up. So in any event, you know, I, I don't want to go any further with this story. I've gone from, you know, when I was seven down to the year 2000. You know, and then, um, as Clancy said, I came to this country flying for Pan Am. At that time, I was uh, 21 years old, so I could come as an adult on my own. Um, and I was hired. I had started, you know, pr to well, I shouldn't say started, to continue studying languages. Uh, because, and this was my mother, you know, when I was a little child, learn languages. So maybe 
we, and of course at that time she meant she herself, we wouldn't get raped. And the, if the Russians come <laughs> first, you know, we would not have to maybe go through all, uh, you know, the, the miseries. Uh, but we were very lucky that the Americans came first. And the Americans were supposed to be very nice to children. But nevertheless, to learn languages had already sort of become a second, what should I say, inoculated in my brains, if there would be such a thing that you inoculate the brains, you know. But what also was one of the first impressions I had of the Americans, and don't forget at that time, they were the enemies, right? And I have a, a well, not a long, yeah, I have a passage in the book this is also such a visual memory of the American combat troops walking in. And that too is really an unforgettable impression. And when I write, you know, part of my memoirs are really almost describing scenes that I see in my mind you know, that so impressed themselves visually on me. And then the, the great satisfaction I had, you know, recently, well, in the last couple of years, then I have looked at pictures, photographs that were taken of the combat troops as they walked through villages or towns or the countryside in Germany. And I was gratified, in a sense, because this is also how I remember it. But so, in any event, I learned languages. And I was already working as an interpreter a little bit, and I went back to the university. And then Pan Am advertised, major advertising campaign, because they needed airline hostesses that spoke several languages. You know, Pan Am only flew internationally, did not fly domestically. So they needed people who spoke several languages. And uh, so I applied, and lo and behold, I was accepted. And this is how I then came to this country. And then I had a first marriage, and we lived in Atlanta, and then I went back to my studies and got all my academic credentials. And then, of course, academia became my uh, profession. And there I met Walter Strauss, who was my dissertation advisor. And I have always said, and I say in the book, he really was like a midwife to this horrible, horrible knowledge, you know, which was the Holocaust. And I have been very lucky that it came to me in a way that was couched in friendship you know, and not the confrontation in anger or hatred. So I was very, very lucky. And of course, then really in my publications made it my life's uh, focus to find out what was going on in Germany. But my publications are not so much about during the Nazi regime, but afterwards, how generation after generation, every 15, now I could give you my you know, lecture on, on that book, The Language of Silence, how there came these many, every 15 years, a new generation of writers who look back at the Nazi regime and interpreted it. And of course, there then the questions were, what do they write about? What do they not write about? Even when they do write about the Holocaust, how do they write? What do they not say? And in fact, this coming Tuesday, I'm going to be at Bard College, which is in uh, New York State, up on the Hudson River. And we are having a discussion on Günther Grass, who just published, well, he published in German his memoirs, and they're coming out in English, I think in June or July, in which now, where he is an 80-year-old gentleman, he now admits that he was a member of the Waffen-SS. It took him his adult life. And he kept silent. And I remember when I wrote, you know, The Language of Silence, the one 
uh, yeah, negative criticism that I received by a historian and not even a literary scholar was that I was too harsh on Grass. Now, of course, I didn't know that Grass was keeping this aspect of his past life secret that he was a member of the Waffen-SS, but I could identify in his literary work silences. You know, there were gaps where he would not speak about or where he would come in with a different angle or whatnot. And that was held against me, that I was imputing Grass, you know, saying he, he did not level when, of course, Grass was the paragon of accusing Germany for not only the Holocaust, but the post-war politicians and writers for not leveling. And, you know, and this only came out now in the last couple of months. And it's almost, there's a, yeah, I, I, not only could I vaguely identify, though not specifically what he had been quiet about, but I really shouldn't be surprised. You know, in my own life experience with my parents, I have encountered all these silences for any number of reasons. So there, I think Grass has done a, a tremendous disservice to Germany and not only German intellectuals, but the standing of, you know, the respect that Germany is gaining now by trying to confront the Holocaust. And maybe he's trying to do that too, but it is so late that, uh, you know, I feel it's more a blemish than, than uh, you know, leveling at this point. But so in any event, this is what my academic life then has very much been um, concerned with. So I just want to say a few, warmer, a few more words about cancer. And there I also felt, um, I, you know, even here and even now, I want to be very careful not only with my choice of language, but my attitude, because my father died of cancer, cancer of the throat. And we all know that it's an excruciating way of dying, or it can be an excruciating way of dying. And I do not want to make light of that. But for those of us who have been able to survive, even if just temporarily. You know, we all, all of us, not just cancer survivors, live on, well, the fact that, you know, life is not permanent. Uh, but I do feel that cancer has brought me gifts. And I say this with great hesitation because some people may not feel that cancer actually brings you gifts. But the most prominent gift, I feel, is thankfulness every day that I'm still alive. That is the greatest gift, and that I am not just taking it for granted and being bogged down by this and that and the other. But hey, you know, it could be that you're not here anymore. So the worst has not happened. And, you know, when I speak with other people who have had cancer, uh, we all agree that there is so much reason to be thankful. And so much, you know, of, of the strength that we feel and of the, the gratefulness that we really want to pass on. And, you know, as is also so often the case in, in, in the United States more than anywhere else, and it is so wonderful. One of the great, I think, you know, uh, uh, what should I say, self-realizations of individuals, if they suffer from a cause, they go out and speak on it and found groups and, you know, grow like I have become uh, very involved with cancer and speaking for cancer 
uh, groups or, for example, Guild, uh, guild, guild um, what is it called, Ratner, you know. So I have been speaking there and it's so wonderful that there are these support groups that come out of, you know, the individual efforts and not only in relation to cancer but in relation to other things too. And so let me just give you one example and then I will really end about cancer and how it really can create a bond, a very positive bond, and I call it a gift. Um, a little detour before I come back to that point. When Bill ran, and of course we talked not only about my my German background, but you know also about the fact that I am older than Bill. And so I adopted this little slogan in my own mind, full disclosure, full disclosure. And all the dates, if you want to check at them, they're all in the book. And I remember, you know, when, when um, Ronald Reagan ran for president, I think Nancy Reagan tried to shave a few years off her biography. And I don't know whether you remember how the press, that was the news, you know. And it's not worth it. I find the press, once they have the facts, they are happy and they walk away. But they can smell it if the facts are maybe not the facts. And then they keep digging and digging and digging. So full disclosure, I had a mastectomy. And, you know, I have spoken with people who have mastectomies and others who have reconstruction. And I must say, reconstruction to me sounds much more scary than the mastectomy. It, it's still something. And so at the time, I, I was so, you know, I couldn't even focus. As I had said before, I had to be told many, many times. And then I said, no, no, just a mastectomy. And, you know, the, uh, Sur the uh, surgeon was nice enough and said, well, you know, Ernestine, if you want to change your mind, you can always have a reconstruction later. Well, that left me off the hook. I knew I would never have one, but it was very nice. So full disclosure, I have a mastectomy. And for a long time, you know, you could, if you wore something low cut, you could see the scar. So of course, I couldn't wear anything low cut. It took me years to say, oh, well, you know, maybe a little camisole, or maybe, you know, now I have a camisole. Uh, maybe, what should I do? And I went to Saks, and this is now the happy ending of my, you know, long disquisition. Uh, I went to Saks, and there was this nice little suit that I really thought I ought to have. And uh, I looked at it, and I went into the dressing cabin, and I tried it on, and of course, it was too low. And the saleswoman came in and she said, well, you know, you could have a hook or you could have a camisole or you whatever, you know. And I said, you know, it's still very sensitive because I have a mastectomy and so this is a big thing for me. And she said, oh, you had a mastectomy. I had reconstruction. And I looked at her, and she had a sweater on, and she looked very nice. I said, huh, you know, it looks really very good. And she said to me, want to see it? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> you know, and so there we were, two adult, whatever, mature women, standing in that changing cabin, you know, taking our top clothes off, I showing her my scar, she showing me her reconstruction, and we looked at each other and we embraced and hugged and we cried and we laughed at the same time and we have been friends ever since. So that was a gift, I would like to say, and I'm going to leave it at this now. You stimulated me by your presentation. I have a question, but before I get to the question, I must respond to what you've said. You referred to your memory flow and the continuity you tried to create in that memory. And it's interesting because I came through a similar environment, a Nazi experience for a number of years. And the interesting thing is that I don't have that continuity but I have a discontinuity 
I recognized the peaks of the tragedies and reluctant to fill in yeah. the gaps. So it's a little different. Uh, that's emotional. Yeah, I know. I know. But what I do want to ask you is this, and that refers to your uh, fact that you are culturally a German, but more importantly, uh, you're an ed educator. And so often I've been puzzled. We have a cliche in, that says, get education. That will change humanity and the world. And I can't help but turn back to Germany and Austria the epitome of education and right. culture, and the first to turn in support of Hitler, the educators, the cultured. So my question to you is, why do we persist in this continuous saga of believing that education is the solution when we have real data to support it's contrary to that? I don't have a solution. But I'm curious what your view is regarding that. Yeah. I mean, you are absolutely right. And I heard some mumblings here when you said that uh, really the intellectual elite of Germany backed Hitler. Of course, Hitler was also supported by you know, the unemployed, the rabble, the half criminals. We know that too. But it's not an either or. It was the university professors, it was the lawyers, it was really the establishment that came out of the empire and the Weimar Republic. You know, the Weimar Republic was all, only 14 years. So there was a continuity of personnel. And Hitler was the one who presumably brought order back. Uh, so that a lot of the elite went with Hitler. The military elite, which was mostly the aristocracy, the Prussian aristocracy, which had not been disbanded after World War I, which is one of the things that I really hold against President Wilson, uh, that elite, the military elite, found that they had to follow Hitler because of their oath of loyalty, even though they considered Hitler riffraff. But there were the many different groups that all did support Hitler. There is no question about it. I am teaching a course right now at the New School, and I have to add, I come back to this, the New School for Social Research, which I think Clancy uh, mentioned before, where I'm teaching right now, the New School for Social Research, it's such an honor for me to teach there because it was founded as the university in exile. It was in 1933, and very few people know this, and I have said to the people at the New School, why don't you say this? This is something to be so proud of that the New School, which had no endowment, which was only four years old, invited, well, at first it was 18, scholars and then more with their families. So it wasn't just one professor to Harvard and one professor to Yale. And I have nothing against those one, you know, Harvard and Yale, but it was the new school that really understood um, what it meant. And they really had the German university structure the contemporary, uh, the current uh, graduate faculty is still a German kind of university structure from that time. I had to say this, even though I am now getting to your answer. So the course I'm teaching right now is uh, called The Shadows of German Romanticism. And by the shadows, I really mean the undercurrent, uh, which um, was very politically oriented and came out of resistance to the French occupation, you know, under Napoleon. And uh, quite a number of philosophers, particularly Fichte, developed a very strong nationalism long before there was a Germany that could become nationalistic. And out of that, and it is true, one of my images, well, no, not images, models, what should I say? The person I very, very much admire is the historian Fritz Stern. 
and uh, he showed how the thoughts out of Romanticism uh, generated the future kind of popularized nationalism. He was very clear in establishing it wasn't the serious thinkers who turned to Nazism. But we know, for example, Nietzsche could be bent and twisted to follow or to, to then be used as an excuse for some of the Nazi ideas. Now, Fritz Stern made it very clear. I was so glad he said, you know, none of the, how should I say, the SA people, you know, the stormtroopers, the original ones, would ever read Nietzsche or any of uh, these uh, writers who sort of intellectually prepared what Nazism then fed on. But the whole idea of, of you know, the Arianism, the folkishness, uh, the quality of the Aryans, that does come out of the resistance to Napoleon and it comes in the early 19th century. And particularly, I think, when Germany was then defeated, uh, although they denied that they were defeated after World War I, that's why after World War II, the Allies insisted that it was called unconditional surrender, because the message didn't you know, sink in after World War I. Uh, there was a lot of room after World War I to build resentment against the peace treaty. And the resentment came not only from you know, the lower unemployed classes, but it did come from the upper classes. So that the, the various classes never really actively joined. But on their stratified levels, they all went in the same direction. I can't help but be very curious about how you felt, even though you were a child, living in Germany during that period. Uh, could you tell us where you were living, uh, what happened? Please do. There again, you know, as I tried to say before, I was very lucky in the sense that my biological father, let's talk about him first, was then, you know, when, when Hitler uh, remilitarized, and my father had been a state trooper in Bavaria. And when Hitler then remilitarized in violation of the Weimar Peace Treaty, and the world was watching, um, my father was given the choice which branch of the army he wanted to join. And, well, not only my father, you know, everybody who was in, in uh, any kind of police situation. And he uh, joined the Air Force. So he uh, was then in the Air Force. And because he was trying to get his high, what do you call it, the diploma for admission to university, he got that in night hours. Uh, he was not immediately um, put into the officer's corps. He started out as a lieutenant in the Air Force and ended up as a captain. And um, I've, not in relation to my father, but in some other relation, I read a biography of a soldier who ended, he started with a gefreiter. What is a gefreiter? The lowest level. And he didn't even quite make it to a sergeant. And he did this on purpose. He said, the last thing I want in this war is to advance for you know personal and moral reasons, but also because the more you advanced, the more likely that you were going to be shot. And you know, because I think the ratio of the officers were in the infantry were shot. I, I don't exactly know, but there was very little chance of survival. So my father tried to keep as low a profile as possible. He was not in the party because for him the military was enough. My legal father was a party member, but on all of these documents that I had mentioned before, I then uh, received from the Berlin Document Center. Uh, he was a, I don't know whether you call it a fellow traveler. He joined the party in 38, but never 
climbed in the party. And then as of 39, apparently he was in the infantry, but either because he was already older, so hear me, I'm not very clear and specific either, but I can't give you more. Um, he was a, um, a, a Schreiber, you know, now I look at you as my native informant, I don't really know what you, you know, he was a, yeah, kind of a military stenographer. And this is about all I know of him, and I then did not go any further. My mother uh, was not a member of the party because she always said she was too individualistic. It is, you know, there are these, these stories, okay, I give you a story, uh, in the sense that I always try to denigrate the stories, and you can hear that in my tone of voice, simply because uh, I did not find the excuse which she meant to give me, a really acceptable excuse, the story being, uh, she, uh, this was now 43, early 44, she went to a movie house with a girlfriend of hers. And as the movie started, you had the newsreels from the front, you know, from the war. I cannot say war theater, uh, from the, the fighting front. I just take issue with the word theater. You know, I, I, I don't find that. Uh, so, and my mother made a comment to her girlfriend sitting next to her about this madman who was still going on with the war. And she was overheard by someone sitting behind and was being denounced to the Gestapo that I was, uh, uh, that she was, well, whatever, not supporting the regime. And she had a friend who was also, who was, must have been a Gestapo member or a party member. In any event, he found out when this person came into this office. This is now at night at 10 o'clock after the movie, right? This person went to the Gestapo and said, you know, Frau Baumaster, she just said something horrible about the Hitler. And this other person knew my mother. He was one of the 10, you know, on each finger she had one of her admirers. And even though he was in the party, he, he admired her. So I remember someone knocking at the door at 11 o'clock at night. And I heard them whisper, and, but I went back to sleep. So this person came to my mother and said, they are going to get you tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. You better either have an excuse or not be here, but they will be here. And so my mother that night went, by that time it must have been midnight or one o'clock in the morning, went to her doctor and got a certificate that was predated that she was pregnant. And so when at eight o'clock in the morning they came to take her to interrogation or whatever, she said, you know, you cannot touch a woman who is bearing yet another child for our Führer or something like this. So she was not taken. But what she was trying to say was that she, so it was not only the Holocaust and the Jewish victims, but that the Germans even went against their own kind. And we had this little conversation here, you know, where particularly toward the end of the war, the fanatics became so fanatic that they would kill their own soldiers, their own, you know, then they had something where the old, generation had to fight with pitchforks, you know, against the Russian tanks. If they didn't do that, they would be hung, and, you know. So it was, Germany really went mad, and my mother was trying to say, you know, it wasn't only against the Jews. Then there was one more scene where my mother and father had a rendezvous during the war, and my father coming from the front would get a ration card, you know, so that while he was on furlough, he would have something to live on. And my mother said, or my father, you know, and one time we were walking, I think it was in Munich, and there was an elderly couple, and my father, and, and Fatim, gave them his ration card. And instead of me saying, oh, how nice and kind, and you helped and the elderly couple, you know, in need of a ration card, clearly was Jewish. 
I said, and she expected me to say, oh, how kind and how nice of you. And what I said was, ha, so you knew that the Jews were discriminated against and that they did not get enough food and that they were walking. So my mother then said, well, there is nothing that I can say that you wouldn't find fault with ever since you came to America. You have become so aggressive. You know, so the confrontation immediately was translated to her instead of saying that they were trying to show sympathy, I was being aggressive. So um, does that answer your question completely? Oh, 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 I lived, okay. I lived in Passau. And when you look on the map, Passau is on the Danube. And it is now right on the border to Austria. But when I grew up, uh, it was, you know, Austria and Germany had come together. I refused to say Austria was a next. Austria voted for being a next. You know, it was not a victim. It was an, act, an active agent. Um, so that, at the time, was the greater Germany. And so I didn't know that there was a time when, you know, walking across to the other side of the river, that was no longer Germany, but was Austria. And then after the war, uh, we all moved back to the city where both my parents were from. It's called Ingolstadt. So if you visualize going upstream on the Danube, you know, it makes that little, it has that little bump in the direction toward the Black Forest. That's where Ingolstadt is, which is now the place where where the Audis are being produced. Um, and it was very much destroyed because close to Ingolstadt was a military airport. And there's still a little airport there now. But since we did not live there, I was very lucky in not being exposed to a lot of bombing, just a little bit. And then there was some, something else to that question. Where did I grow? Yeah, do I remember anything from the Nazi regime? And I do not because, you know, I was very small. And then when the war started in 39, all the men were gone, which of course to me was heaven on earth because there was no supervising authority. Not that there was much before in my family. And the women were all working. So we were roaming the streets and, for example, I do remember I was six years old and I saw a Shirley Temple movie. And I, and this was 41, and I, you know, now as a grown up, I said, could not be Shirley Temple, an American movie in wartime Germany, no way. And I thought, you know, my memory served me wrong until I found out that apparently Goebbels, having, you know, the minister of propaganda, having been such a fan of movies, there was still a cultural agreement going on between Germany and the United States for exchanges of films. So indeed, I did see Shirley Temple with his poodle hair, and it was so popular that my mother did that to me. You know, being a hairdresser, she felt I should look like Shirley Temple, so she put all these curls on me. Um, after, you know, after I had met Walter Strauss, I then, in one of my aggressive moods, coming, you know, to visit my parents in Germany, I said to my mother, well, you know, I cannot believe that there were no Jews in Passau when I grew up. And she said to me, yes, yes, there had been some. And then she said how nice they had always been. And they uh, owned that department store that I still knew. Only then it was called Grenzland Kaufhaus, you know, border country a department store. And it was the border between Germany and Austria. She said, and they were always so very nice. And I look at you, you know, and I want to come back to the point where you said, how could such well-educated people commit such barbarous acts. And I now come from the opposite point of view, very cynical, saying, you know, the Jewish merchants were always so nice, and it meant nothing.
you know, when the time came, it meant nothing. And my mother said, you know, and they were always so nice, and she was at that time with her, you know, hairdresser salary, buying a trousseau. Before I was conceived, she thought eventually she'd marry my father. And so she bought her sheets and towels and everything at this department store. And she said, and every time there would be a little extra gift, a pair of gloves or something nice, and how wonderful they were. So I said, well, and what happened to them? And she said, well, you know, they were lucky. They sold and they left. Well, I said, and you call it lucky? I said, well, how would you feel? And now I would have to, but I'm not going to go back into her history where her mother was a refugee from France. I said, how would you feel if you had to sell your life's accomplishments, your department store, for a pittance and be thrown out of the country of which you are a citizen? I said, and you dare say that they were lucky. You know, I said, would you feel lucky if you had nothing and you had to leave and you didn't know where you go? Then again, oh, you and your aggression, you know. But so these were a few of the instances, but I personally have no memory. Doctor, uh, Dr. Bradley? Yes. Um, I have two questions, and I'll let you select which one you'd like to answer since Maybe we're Maybe I want to answer both, and you cannot <laughs> no, go home. No, <laughs> since we're running out of time. I'm, I'm, I'm interested, because of your background, uh, to comment on the discussion that's going on in this country, this, the role of the United States in the world. Mm. In other words, the, uh, some people think that we are, uh, we're nation builders. Some people, as, as the only remaining superpower, that we should try to bring democracy to the world, whereas other people say, no, let's sit back and take care of our own national interest. The other question I have is about, you're in a sort of special situation, one of the few people that have gone through a political campaign. What lesson did, the big lesson that did you, did you learn from going through that campaign with your husband? What, what did you learn, what did you bring away from that campaign? Well, the first question I don't want to answer at all. <laughs> because, you know, it's a very political question and I think a very profound one. But I do not see myself really as a political expert. I, you know, if I say anything, I'm sure I would just echo the sentiment of most people here. What a tremendous shame it is how this country has fallen from really the world leadership role to now being attacked and looked down upon for reasons. You know, if you had asked me how Germany views uh, the United States, I might have gone a little bit into it, but let's forget about it. Um, the second question about the campaign, I must say I enjoyed very, very much campaigning. And what I enjoyed was to really get to know the best of the American process and the American people. You know, uh, I had, if you want to, I had the fool's freedom. I could speak from my heart. I was speaking, you know, for the candidate who I thought was the best, unabashedly, uh, but I, did not speak on issues. I did not, I refused to be briefed. I did not want to be a surrogate speaker. I really only wanted to speak in the unique position that nobody else had, which was the position of the wife. And uh, so I did that and I always, at that time, it was, it should be true now, but it wasn't. I felt, particularly coming from my background, that America, can and should and did at the time lead by the power of its example as a democracy. And when, you know, when I spoke, maybe mostly they were self-selected groups, but like I had said before about cancer, people are involved, you know, people want to support a candidate that they believe in, they want to do fundraisers, they want to go out and proselytize. And to me, to see democracy in action 
was a wonderful, wonderful experience, even if I didn't agree with some opponent's you know, opinion. That was not as important for me as to really see how democracy can work but how it really only works in this country, because in Europe, democracy works very differently. When you have a parliamentary system, it works very differently. So I, I really did enjoy that. And when I had you know, my, in, uh, my introductory sentence, you know, America should lead by the power of its example, then the second sentence could always be, which doesn't mean we are perfect, but Americans above all know what they are can still improve and are very self-critical. And there is still a ways to go in many, many different fields. But we, are, we were, well, I think we still are the leading nation. There is no doubt about that. And I just hope that we will rally and catch our breath, and more than our breath. Thank you very, very much. I don't want you to, to stay. Thank you.